we have to realize too that even though what we do is so important and we love it, um, you know, if, if people are dying of this, like we are willing to sacrifice and not go out and do what we love. And I, I think the whole community is willing to do that. And it, it's been really, you know, we're all really grateful. Welcome to The Choir Baton, a podcast designed to engage with people and stories, ideas, and inspirations stemming from choir. No other art form, no sport, no hobby, no business requires a group of people to execute a communal goal with just their voices. Join me, your host, Beth Philemon, as I interview guests who are singers, teacher conductors, instrumentalists, and community members. Together, we'll ask questions, seek understanding, and share insight from our experiences in life and in choir. Well, welcome, Choir Baton listeners, to another episode of the Choir Baton podcast. I'm going to start by reading something for you all that has made its way into our community within the last five days. It says, here is the deal, my friends. Unless you are singing in a room with people, it isn't choir, period. Choir is about connection. Choir is about 30 or 210 or six singers all shaping a vowel so perfectly that the overtones extend up to the heaven and make the angels weep. Choir is your college roommate. She won first place in your hometown Met auditions. And your great aunt Ruth, she turned 89 last month and wants everyone to know she still has her high notes. They sing together every Sunday, and the paint doesn't peel off the walls. Why? Choir, that's why. Choir is magical. Alone, I am a soprano, but in choir, I'm a tenor and an alto and a bass. When you sing in a choir, the sound of the whole choir comes out of your mouth. Boom, magic. Choir isn't something you can do alone with a webcam on your computer. It just isn't, period. So be kind to your choral friends. We are suffering. We feel this disconnect keenly. Yes, we know about Eric Whitaker and his virtual choir, and we love Eric. He is our token rock star and makes our whole sport sexier. And in these days of deadly airborne pathogens, choir is as much a contact sport as football. We will retreat to the sidelines. We will learn to use Zoom and Google Hangouts. We will record our voices and send them into the unknown. We retreat willingly because at the end of the day, we love great Aunt Ruth and her questionable high notes. Her life is on the line and choir just isn't worth the risk. But these days won't last forever, my friends, and we will make it through this. And when we sing together again, it will be amazing. Those words are by Joan Riddle Eidelman, Steinman, excuse me, Joan Riddle Steinman. And I am so honored to have you as a guest on the Choir of Baton today. Welcome, Joan. Oh, Beth, I'm so excited to be here. Such an honor to be a part of the Choir of Baton, and I've been listening to it, and this is thrilling to be on this show. Well, I read your your words, I think like the day that it had come out, I saw it begin popping up, and then... Um, it just continued to spread throughout our choir conductor community. And I thought, I identified so much with this. Others are clearly identifying behind it. You could just feel the emotion. Uh, And I had to speak to you. I had to know who you were and what your story was and like what prompted you to write this and all the things. So let's just kind of start even from there. Where, where did all of this kind of come from? Yeah, Beth, um, Good question. I, I, first of all, I'm so honored that people were touched by the words that I wrote and it was a very emotional process for me writing it. Um, and then to see so many shares and so many, so many things, you know, happening all over, like, you know, shared in Australia and New Zealand and England. And, and I, I thought, wow, this is, this is really amazing. I'm really grateful. I, and by far, everyone was very kind. They wrote back, thanks for saying these things. Thanks for, and I, I think I basically just said we were, we're what we're all feeling during the, the beginning of this corona quarantine, social distancing, um, that, that our sport, our choir sport is so about connection and um, that is hard to do over the computer. But also, you know, we're so, 
we're, we're we're choir people, we're educators, we're teachers. We're so used to just like, oh, do you need me to do this? I will do this. I'll move those risers. Do you need me to transpose this into a different key? I'll do that. Like, you know, we were we are eager to make accommodations and do things and change. And so everybody's like, yeah, we can get our line, our classes online in two days. And I, I'm like, I, it was a rough week for me last week. I guess I'll, let me just start with a few of the personal things. So yeah. I kind of did a calendar um, on the page to take some notes and prep for this interview. So, so February was really fun for my choirs. We went to New York and it was really great. And then I came home and, um, like so many people, I went to an ACDA conference. We had our, you know, regional conferences. And so the first week of March was our regional conference and it was in Salt Lake City, which is where I live. And so that was really exciting. And I, I was on the, the planning committee. So I got to help with, you know, the organization of that, which was so fun and wonderful. And I heard some amazing choirs, concerts I'll never forget. Um, touching, touching the, like, just really beautiful moments. And Eric Whitaker himself was at our conference. And so, you know, I saw him um, and, you know, stood next to him. But didn't, I didn't really meet him, but. Did you touch uh, it, like pet him? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing, lady? I didn't do that. <laughs> um, so, you know, we had our, we had our choral convention and, and then, um, then the next week is when everything in the world shut down. And um, so that was emotional. So I came back from, ACDA where I heard these amazing concerts and I'm like, okay, we're, we're excited. Like I have all these ideas. I'm so excited to implement them, all these choral rehearsal techniques and all these um, ideas for great rep and concert themes. And then the next day, uh, the next week we came back and to school as I, a lot of people did. And um, in my top ensemble on that Tuesday, I, I'm a mom and I teach part-time. So I teach Tuesdays and Thursdays and then every other Friday. So on my top ensemble on Tuesday, um, they'd asked that we use that class period um, for my chamber choir to have the um, graduation ceremony of a senior who is graduating. His mother um, had cancer and she was about to, you know, she was about to pass away. And they said, can you, her greatest wish is that we, you know, she sees her son graduate from high school and she doesn't, she can't wait until, you know, May when everyone graduates, like we need to do this now. So my, my school, which is wonderful, um, planned this graduation ceremony in my choir room and my choir sang and they invited all the family and we just did it over a period, you know, and it was, it was magical because, you know, here, here's this, you know, my singer, he, the, the boy is in my classes and, and then his whole family is there and his mom is there and, Anyway, so that was on Tuesday, and then she passed away a few days later, and that was right in the midst of all of the closures, and, um, you know, Disneyland shut down, and, you know, the NBA got canceled. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. We'll all remember this. We're all going to remember, yeah, we, that, that March of 2020, that was, that was something. Anyway, so I was very emotional already, um, and then... And then the next week, uh, on the first day that we were supposed to do online classes, Salt Lake City had this earthquake that, I mean, it's a 5.7 earthquake, which I, if you're from California, that's probably nothing for you, but I'd never been in an earthquake. And we were like, what's going on? Like, as, and all the schools are shut, you know, COVID-19, we're all quarantining ourselves and social distancing. And then suddenly there's this earthquake and it's like, what next universe? Like, we, we got to figure this out, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so I was very emotional. So... And, and I, I, I was kind of, you know, walking around my house, like occasionally looking at Facebook, trying to think, how can I teach choir online? How can I teach? And everyone's like, everyone's like, okay, what do I do? Like, they're like making lesson plans. And I'm like, looking around, like, I, I just can't do it. I'm just too emotional to like, think about teaching choir online. So I, um, I just started writing. I started writing this, this blog post. And I was like, and I had just set up, I just, it was timing. I just set up a website for, I'm writing a musical, which is a different thing, but um, I set up my first website and I bought my first domain name, which I was super excited about. And I know <laughs> these little things. And um, I thought, oh, well, okay. I can put this blog post on um, my new website, which, you know, the, the day it was born. Um, so anyhow, I, I started writing and 
I came up with, with those words that you so eloquently wrote, and I was really grateful to hear someone read them. Yeah. And I mean, I can talk a little bit about, I've kind of analyzed, like, why did this go viral? I've never had anything go viral before, you know? Um, I could kind of talk about that a little bit. If I'd love want. that. Okay. So I think, you know, I think one of the things that made it so, um, so compelling, I mean, it's pretty short, right? You know, it's four paragraphs, you know, and it's a definite target audience, you know? I read it to my husband, he's a non-musician and he's like, you're calling choir a sport? And I'm like, oh honey, I love you, but yes, yes I am. Um, and you know, there were some universal references, right? So it's short and there's also like, we can all relate to um, the, you know, singing in a church choir with the old lady and also, you know, being the young soprano who's like pretty good, you know, and, and the great thing is at some point in your life, you're going to be both of those people, you know, hopefully, because I, I hope I singing is something you should do your whole life. Obviously, you know that we listeners know that. Um, so, you know, you'll be one of those people at, at one point. Um, and so it was like, it was, you know, in the, it's in the zeitgeist, right? Um, and then it had another, a couple other fun references, like, uh, everyone knows who Eric Whitaker is and uh, everyone has been getting emails like start a virtual choir, you know, and, and I just have to say, I'm really grateful for everyone who sent me an email to start a virtual choir. I really am because that means they care about my program and what I do and they are thinking of me and I'm so, so grateful for that. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that I'm really grateful, but also I know how much time that takes and I have spent my whole life, as we all have, um, refining my rehearsal techniques so that I do rehearsal really well. You know, we don't waste a minute. We don't, you know, we, I know how to gauge the, the group, like how are they doing? Is this too fast a pacing, too slow a pacing? And then when I think about doing that online, it just, I was just so depressed, you know? I just, and I'm not saying that I can't, like we can, we are innovative, right? We are, we can come up with content to do online. That is not a problem. Like we can give, you know, we can do voice lessons, we can give, you know, listening examples, there's things we can do, but it isn't choir. Right. And I was mourning the loss of choir. So, uh, so that's, let's see, another reason I think it went viral um, is that, uh, is that, you know, just some, some of the imagery, like I'm, I'm really grateful that, I, I don't know, I felt really inspired to write, write things like um, the overtones extend up to heaven. I've, <laughs> I've been reading, um, uh, let's see, Do let's see, why am I forgetting his name? Uh, uh, Don Brenniger's book about um, uh, uh, Can Pitches Be Perfect? And, yes. and he, he, he's a genius. And I met him at ACDA last week or two weeks ago, whenever that was, two years ago. I know. And I've been reading all of his books about, you know, overtones and trying to, trying to learn. And so I, I, that was in my mind, you know? Um, and... So, so, you know, those things, and there's the football reference, like, you know, calling choir sports. And then at the end of the day, like, we have to realize too, that even though what we do is so important and we love it, um, you know, if, if people are dying of this, like we are willing to sacrifice and not go out and do what we love. And I, I think the whole community is willing to do that. And it, it's been really, you know, we're all really grateful. So that, those are kind of some of my ideas of, of what we, you know, why it went viral and why it appealed to so many people. But I just, we need to take a moment and, and I did, I needed to take a moment and like acknowledge the loss, you know, um, this may be months that we can't meet with our ensembles and just to acknowledge that that is painful, um, that we will miss them, that they will miss us, that we will miss that that connection that a choir gives you and that the reason that we all love it so much. So I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that for a few moments. And I think, I think everyone did. And then, and it was a great distraction as I was, you know, I wrote it and then I, I, I posted it a few different places because I kept getting like people, people, there were so many people saying, how do I start a virtual choir? I mean, there still are. And, and by the way, I think it's great. If you want to start a virtual choir, that is, really, really great. Like whatever we can do to make it through this is great. Right. But um, I just wanted to us all to take back and say, hey, choir directors, like we need a pat on the back. Like we can't use our skills right now that we've worked so hard to refine. And we just, we can acknowledge the loss. We can acknowledge the loss. 
I think that is, that's huge. And you even still have so eloquently said that of which we struggle to say and that of which we sometimes have even struggled to, to realize because we are those innovators. We are those people that say, yes, I can move those risers. Yes, I can transpose that key. Yes, I can teach choir online. And, and because we've made such an effort to pivot and to stay connected to our community, we've not necessarily realize that we do have this to grieve and allowing ourselves time to grieve. And how um, how interesting, how timely that you were engaged in such a grief for your student and for his loss too, and how you, you knew how to not necessarily manage grief, but you were experiencing that as well. And perhaps that enabled you to be more susceptible and open to what we were so many of us were experiencing but unable to verbalize at the time too yes absolutely yeah the the thing that also struck me so much about what you were saying that i sometimes struggle to articulate as a conductor is when you said choir is magical alone, I am a soprano, but in a choir, I'm a tenor, an alto, and a bass. And when you sing in a choir, the whole choir comes out of your mouth. Thank you. I wish I could take credit for that. I am sure I heard that from someone else. Um, there's parts of this article that are my own words, and, and that was it. I, I know I got that in some, some workshops. But we all say that, right? Like right. we all yeah. say that, and and you're so you're so kind to to um, you know try to say that. But like you pin the way in which you pinned it though is from your heart, and what is so so important. And I loved what you said too um, when we were talking a little bit before this, where you were like, "I hope Eric knows I'm not calling him out or poo pooing his his virtual uh, choir." But I also I love how eloquently you said that too. You're not hating on the virtual choir experience, and I hope that you have not received backlash from people for talking about that. No, most people have been really, really kind. And if, if I have at all that I wrote back and I, I said, no, no, I'm like, do virtual choir, like do whatever it takes to stay connected to your ensemble. Right. Um, but also just don't feel, don't feel pressure to reinvent the wheel. This is a time to grieve and to sit back and realize, you know, this is, this is important. This social distancing is important. We, we don't even know the magnitude of it yet. We don't even know how important it will be. And yeah, I was, I was watching all these numbers of like, you know, like 500, or well, like 300 shares, three, all this. And I thought, oh my goodness, like I wrote about Eric Whitaker. Like what if someone forwards it to him? What if he bans me from doing his music for life? I, you know, I'm planning on doing one of his songs next year. I already have it, you know, purchased. And I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, and I, I was, I was complaining to one of my friends or well, just talking to her about it. And She's like, you know, you did also call him a sexy rock star. I think that's going to mitigate any, you know, any like poo-pooing you did a virtual choir. And I was like, okay, good. Well, at least we're even now. So. So Eric, because I know that you were an avid listener to the Choir Baton podcast, uh, reach out to Joan and, and, and uh, <laughs> mend that fence or fear, or, uh, you know, unite together about a passion for a virtual choir. No, but I, I'm just curious to also know a, li a little bit more about you. It's so, um, you know, I really don't know a ton about your journey, but just in hearing you talk and your passion for learning and passion for what you do, how did you come to choir? Oh, you know, I've always loved singing. And I think that's the only, that's the only requisite, like prerequisite for like being in, like wanting to be in choir is just to love singing. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be anything. And I try and tell my students that all the time. Um, I love singing and I always have. Um, I think that my dad was a singer and my mom played the piano. So I grew up kind of in a, you know, a musical family and we would just right. sing all the time. And that was very fun. And then when I, when I went to, uh, my parents took me to my first opera when I was eight and um, I was living in Omaha, Nebraska at the time. And oh, by the way, I was in the Omaha Children's Choir and I think I saw on Facebook that they had like posted it online and I was like, oh my goodness, I was in that like 30 years ago, you know, it's been a while. Um, but it was kind of fun to see like thinking about my Omaha days. Anyway, so I just, I've always loved to sing and uh, my parents took me to my first opera and I decided I wanted to be an opera singer. And so, you know, all through high school, I took voice lessons and got into college and I majored in vocal performance. And um, I love singing, but I didn't love performing as a soloist. Um, 
I liked it and I liked practicing and I liked all the technique and I, I was fascinated by that. But like whenever I, I had to do an aria, it was way less exciting than when I got to do a duet or something, you know, and I realized I liked the collaborative process so much. Um, but I was about to graduate with a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah in a vocal performance by the time I figured out that I really liked choir so much. And, you know, I was like, what do I do? I, I think I really want to teach choir. So I got, I, I, anyway, but I graduated and I got a job um, just as a grant writer for a nonprofit in the, in the Salt Lake area. And I really missed choir. I was singing in a community choir and I was, you know, I had some connections to choir still, but I missed it. And I thought, I've got to go back to school and get my teacher certificate so I can get, you know, teach choir. Um, and my coworker came in and she was talking to me and she's like, oh, I have to go to my, my, my child's, you know, my, my son's junior high choir concert. Can you believe that? And, and who wants to go to a junior high choir concert? And I was like, I want to go to a junior high. I would love to go to that. And I thought, what? Who says that? Like, I really need to be in this choir world. Mm -hmm. So I was applying to go back to the University of Utah and get um, my teacher cert teaching certificate when um, I saw online this little charter school where I uh, was looking for a choir teacher. And I applied and they said, okay, yeah, we have, we have a, a job, you know, we have, we, you can teach choir, but it's only a part-time position. And I speak German, I lived in Germany for five years. And so I was like, well, could I teach choir and German? Because I really want a full-time job. And so then, so I taught, I taught choir in German there for eight years. And then now that I have three kids, I quit teaching German and I just teach choir. So, um, so that, that's kind of my journey. And it's, it's still, I, I love my school. It's great. It's a tiny little charter school in Salt Lake City, in, in the Salt Lake Valley. And it's called Paradigm. And it's, there's only 430 kids. We don't have sports. So like the music classes are the cool thing to do, which never happens. So it's very exciting, you know? Right. So anyway, it's a really, I've been feeling really blessed to be there. And I dream of going and, you know, getting a master's degree. But right now I just um, try to stay connected and do lots of workshops and conducting lessons and things like that. So yeah, that's uh, kind of the story. I love that. Well, that also explains like this a kinship that I feel to you because one my best, best friends, uh, we met when I was at a, we were both teaching at a charter school, but I was the choir teacher and she was the German teacher. So, you know, the, there's fun. that synergy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that you're at a charter school too. I, I think it'd be really interesting for people people that don't know a ton about the charter world like and I know charter schools can venture and this is not an educational podcast necessarily but what is it what are, are there any misconceptions that people might have about what it is like to teach at a charter school yeah you know it, yes um, I'm sure there are lots of misconceptions because people always ask like well do they have to pay tuition all these kind of things so charter schools are um, and, and they're very controversial even in our own field like educators um, you know, across the board or, or you know, pro charter school or anti charter school. And I, I have my student, my children, my own children go to the, lo the local public school. So I'm not anti public school by any means. Um, but my charter school was just the first one to give me a job. And they've been so kind to me that I've stayed there forever. And, you know, I've built up the program, which has, has been a really wonderful part of my life. Um, charter schools are public schools and you can go to them um, free like any school there's definitely some pluses and some minuses. So we have small classes, very small classes at ours, like a lot of them do. Um, so my, my choir classes are the biggest in the school, you know, they're like 60 and 40 and most classes are like 10 and 15 and 20. Um, so every charter school has a focus, ours has a liberal arts focus. There's so the, the, the advantage is you have smaller classes, but then we don't have lots of the options that other high schools have, like no one can take shop at our school because we don't have a shop because, you know, we're just a small school. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses. Um, if you have a really athletic student that wants to do lots of sports, you'd have to consider if you want to send them to, you know, a school like mine where there are no sports or, um, you know, to go to the high school where they can, you know, do sports. And some, you know, some high schools will be willing to work with you if you go to my school paradigm. Um, and go to the local school and do your sports there, which some of my students do. Um, the thing about my school that is a little different is um, it, it, the students are just really nice to each other. It's just a really nice environment. And I, 
they're very nerdy. I love that. They, they know they're nerdy and it's just a great place to teach at a nerdy school for, you know, students. So. Absolutely. Well, and you mentioned that you've just really grown the program there. And I think that resonates with a lot of choir teachers that are in smaller schools or they're at larger schools, but have smaller choral programs. And yes, you know, you might be a, a unique place where kids are, are very nerdy and they want to be there and they've made sacrifices to be there probably. But what are some ways in which that you have grown your program to such a successful you know, places, things you're doing, and then also from a number standpoint as well. So I've spent a lot of, a lot of years of my life thinking about how to grow choir. And, and um, when I first started, I think, you know, I was so, I was so, I didn't know very much. So I came out of college and, you know, I had my first choir job and I was like, oh, we're going to do this piece. And, you know, I think, um, you know, like, for example, since we talked about Eric Whitaker, I was like, okay, we'll do Leonardo. He's Leonardo with my, you know, Vicky choir. And then I, I hadn't even met the students yet. I'm like, this was a great piece. And then I had like two men and like five girls that could sing. And, and I, I thought, okay, scale back. Like, where are those rounds and like one part pieces? And anyway, so, you know, I, I didn't have the advantage of having done student teaching where, you know, like I had just, I knew I could run in a, I knew I could run a rehearsal because I, I'd been in rehearsals and I, I knew what worked well, you know, right. But there was a lot I didn't know, and I reached out to you know fellow educators around me, like, how what I, what do I do for parents? Can you send me a disclosure and a syllabus? You know those kind of things. So but that's huge. Sometimes I think that's a plus, right? Because people think <laughs> that because they've student taught, they know everything. You know, like that's that's huge. Well, I knew I knew nothing, and especially when I first got my singers, I was like, okay, we're we're gonna do this, guys. We're gonna survive. But um, and and you know, I love teaching choir so much. I've gotten so much better at it though. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for the, I'm so grateful that to be in a craft where you can always improve your skills and it demands every ounce of your talent at all times. Um, you know, that's a real blessing. Um, so things that I've done, let's see. Um, I convinced my boss to have, let us have music recruitment week at the school. And I like gave cookies to everyone who came into the choir room after school. And we did an assembly just for, you know, choir. And I, I made buttons for all of the teachers in my school to wear if they had ever participated in a music ensemble. I and, love that. Yeah. Um, other things, I, I, I got the, you know, our principal is a singer and he's, he's so great. Um, I made him do a solo for the, you know, the, the student body. And, um, you know, I, I had, I just got everyone really involved. Like, you know, this choir is important, guys. We need to do this. And, you know, the, my colleague has since then come in and built up uh, the band and orchestra program at our school, too, which is great. So the arts are, are very strong and, and really wonderful. Right. That's awesome. I love the button idea, even. You know, that visual and buy-in from teachers is huge. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, then another unique thing that you're doing is you literally took a staff assignment that your principal wanted you to do over the summer and said, okay, now I'm going to apply this to me. And it's turned into this whole thing, which also has served as the platform for you to share, which is why we're speaking to you. Talk to us a little bit about the musical. Okay. I, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, we, we got an assignment as educators. Um, so like I said, our school paradigm is a very liberal arts focus and they want, student, they want our students to be reading and writing. Um, they call the teachers mentors and they call the students scholars, you know, so we're, we're you know, we're doing some different things. Um, and they want, they wanted to make sure that the students are really doing a lot of reading and writing. So they gave the mentors the assignment to read two books over the summer, the shift, um, like how seeing people by Kimberly Wyatt and it, I really liked it and then Plato's uh, Meno which is which is the Socratic um, dialogue about how can virtue be taught you know and I, I really liked both of those so they gave us those assignments to read over the summer as mentors and they said um, when you come back we want you to have you know a 20 2500 word essay and um and, and that's what we want you to have. And I thought, okay, well, I, you know, I went to college. I've done essays in my life. I can, I can do that, you know. But then they said, we're going to spend the next year in peer review groups, like reviewing our essays and, and making sure, you know, that they're ready for publication. And I was like, what? 
okay, well then I don't want to barf up an essay that I just, you know, come up with. I, I want this to be really meaningful if I have to spend a year with my colleagues, if I get to spend a year with my colleagues reviewing something, I should say. And so I thought, you know what, I've always, there's lots of things I've always wanted to do. And, um, you know, like write, write a musical and, you know, run a marathon in China. I mean, there's just lots of things you want to do, but then you get a, you get a little nudge and you're like, okay, I guess I'm really going to do this. So I thought if I have to do this essay, I'd rather just write a musical. And I, I asked my boss, I said, can I write a musical instead? And he said, yeah, if you want to spend 10,000 extra hours. And I said, it's better than just writing an essay. Yes. So I started writing this musical Solve for X and I'm really excited about it. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, it is about um, Weston, Weston Zeitgeist is my main character and he is an autistic boy. He is starting his first year of high school and he's very nervous. Um, and he's obsessed with treasure maps. So his sister Lottie, she's a junior in high school and she uh, makes him a treasure map of high school to help him navigate it. So she gives him this map and the, the cafeteria is Skull Rock and the, uh, the locker, the locker passes, the locker hallways are the Eastern Channel and um, the, the math room is the Rocky Ridge and the library is the Rainbow Lagoon. So like everything on the treasure map corresponds with the high school and she kind of walks them through, hey, this is your, you know, this can help your territory be familiar to you now, right? And um, so I sketched out the plot. So by the end of act one, you know, Weston is going to be uh, trying to navigate and, and, but ruining Lottie's life, his sister, you know, it's not going well and, and things are hard, you know. Um, but then, but then act two, um, Weston is very good at math and the musical is called Solve for X. I should do a little plug. Solveforx.com or solveforxmusical.com. Sorry. Okay. Google owned Solve for X. And I was like, I don't want to go against Google. So solveforxmusical.com. Um, and so, so Weston, um, the, the autistic boy, he gets in trouble in math class. He's just, he's being a smart aleck and, but he doesn't know it. He, he just, he doesn't, you know, he is struggling to inter, interact with his, his peers. Um, and his math teacher says, okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. His math teacher says, you are going to, you know, if, in order to pass this class, you have to do 20 hours of peer tutoring. And he says, I don't, I don't want to. And no, and, and you know, his peers don't want to do it with him either. Um, but he has to. And as he does this, um, he, de he develops relationships with his peers and um, they learn to appreciate him for who he is and how he is. And then Solve for X, it's called Solve for X because when his sister gives him the treasure map, she doesn't have an X marks the spot on it. And he says, where's the treasure? If this is a treasure map of the high school, where is it? And she says, you have to find it. You have to look for it. So then he's teaching all of his peers algebra and teaching them how to solve for X. And he realizes that the X that they're all finding right there, that that's the X that marks the treasure, that the interaction that he has with his peers is the treasure of it. Who are you? I, I like, that is amazing. Like there's so, but the intricacies and the beauty of the story and the interaction, I mean, I have chills. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited about it. You know, it's, um, a lot of my students, uh, oh, not, I wouldn't say a lot, but a, a fair handle are on, or amount are on the spectrum. And, um, I've been teaching for, this is my 14th year, so I've seen a lot of them come through and I've seen a lot of them um, fail and I've seen a lot of them really thrive and I'm trying to, trying to see the difference. Also, I have family members that are on the spectrum that I love. Um, it, it is, you know, it's, and I've been doing a lot of research lately into autism um, and spectrum disorders or spectrum, um, I don't, I don't want to say disorder because it, I, I think it could be a real, it can be a real asset. You know, I think that um, our view of autism is changing. Um, it's not, and, and that's a really wonderful thing. And I hope that this musical pays tribute to our autistic community and the services they do for our society. But I've done a lot of research on it. And um, 
it's been fascinating. First of all, autistic people like to be called, most of them like to be called autistic people. They don't like to be called someone with autism because that's like, you know, someone with gayness or something, you know, it's like not a bad part of your life. It's like just a part of who you are that you identify with, right? So like, I am autistic, right? So that, I didn't know that. That was fascinating. And I've, I've read lots of accounts of people who are actually autistic and it's been really fascinating. And I want to make sure that my musical is, um, is, you know, in a, like fits with, with the dialogue that they want to have out there. So it's, it's been very fascinating, but also I, I think that we, we underestimate like the wonderful skills that autistic people can have, the attention to detail, the focus that they can have, um, that the, 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 the honestness, the earnestness, the, the candidness, um, a lot of those things kind of get lost in our society where so much is based on our interpersonal relationships. And I think we as neurotypicals um, need to be aware of the differences and how to navigate with our autistic, our, our autistic community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So what stage are you in right now with the musical? I know there's some tracks online. Yeah. There's I've been some- listening. <laughs> um, you know, I just got to hire a babysitter and get it done. Actually, that's not even possible. I've been doing a lot of writing now that, you know, like life is shut down and um, I, I, you know, put my kids to bed early and run to the piano and try to get some stuff done. But, okay, so I, I have one song completed and my students sang it and that was exciting. And this is, the song is called A Scantron A Day Keeps All Learning at Bay. And that's, that's the only one that's really on YouTube. Um, but it's, uh, it's about standardized testing and the students in the musical, it, it happens in act two and they're all stressed out about taking the ACT, you know. And so I've been writing, I was writing this song and I was listening to the podcast, um, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, Revisionist History. Yeah. And he, I, the, you know, I'm a big fan of his work and I've read his books and things. And he, um, in his season four, he talks about how he takes the LSAT and challenges his assistant to, you know, take the LSAT with him and who could do better. And then he goes into this whole, um, the LSAT is, is the, is the entrance exam for law school for if you wanted to go to law school and he he goes and he takes it and he talks about you know the timing of it like it's a very time time sensitive and and does that is that what it takes to have a good lawyer do you want a lawyer who can think uh, like fast or do you want a lawyer who has to process and and who gets into law school what kind of skills do they have so anyway it's just really fascinating but I was listening to this podcast as I was composing this song um, and I thought, you know, it was just very inspirational. So the song has like all kinds of like ACT, LCT, GRE stuff. It has, you know, all kinds of standardized tests that are in it, you know? Yeah. And um, then, but then the, the funny thing is, so I, I got it, I got it finished and I, I wrote it and my students performed it, which was really fun. We had a mentor showcase like and they're like, you should sing this song. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't know. You guys can, you guys sing my song. Then it's my talent show. So yeah, you guys sing my song. So they did it and it was fun. Um, but then we were going to New York in February and um, I, I was listening to another Malcolm Gladwell po- podcast where he was like, sometimes I ride my bike around Manhattan. And I thought, wait, I'm going to be in Manhattan. I was like, I should, I should reach out to him and see if we can come sing this song for him. And I told my sister this, and she's like, you are such an extrovert. I cannot believe that you reached out to this world famous author and were like, can we come sing for you? So I, I wrote, I reached out to his people and I said, hey, I'll be in New York uh, this week. I was kind of nervous to do it. So I procrastinated it till the day we left. Um, I'll, I'll be in New York this week and there's 24 singers. And I, I wrote this song that was very inspired by Malcolm Gladwell. And I was just wondering if we could come sing it to you at a coffee shop or something. It's only three minutes long. So, you know, we won't, we won't take too long. And, Anyway, his, his people wrote back and were like, uh, thank you, the timing doesn't work, but send us a recording. And I was like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's a thanks, but no thanks. And, you know, okay, thanks. So then I got home back to Utah. And um, on the, the first day of choir after, you know, after, after school, I checked my email and it, there was another email from Malcolm Gladwell's people. And they were like, hey, Malcolm's really excited about this song. Can you send a recording? And I was like, what? like stop the world, like stop everything. Are you kidding me? Malcolm Gladwell knows my name? Like what? 
And I, I had sent a PDF, I sent a PDF of the sheet music, you know, okay. so I didn't have it recorded yet, but I, I sent, you know, the words and stuff. And so I was like, okay, we got to do this. I'll make a recording. And I wanted my students to be on the recording, but this was a Thursday after school. And the next Tuesday, when we could have re recorded in class, they had canceled school for the ACT. So it was just, <laughs> yeah, I know. It was just so- The irony. The irony, right? Yeah, we have to cancel our rehearsals for the, anyway. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll just sing all the tracks. But you know, that night after I got the, the email from Malcolm Gladwell, I like was just walking around my house, like looking at things like, oh, this is, I can't believe it. this is so exciting. I was kind of starstruck. And yeah. you know, I don't, I don't think my kids ate dinner or brushed their teeth. And I think we all kind of collapsed to like 9.30. I was just, mom was like on super excited cloud, you know? Yeah. Okay. So the next day I had forgotten to take my daughter to piano lessons. So the next day the piano teacher calls me and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot. But and then I realized she's a soprano. And I was like, wait a minute, I can sing the alto part. She can sing the soprano part. We can do this. We can record this over the weekend and get it out to Malcolm Gladwell. So I called in all my friends that are singers and we made a recording of um, the song and we sent it out to him, you know, the next week. Um, one of my former students put it, like put the, put the words to it on YouTube. And we had, you know, one of a sound engineer come in and my uncle sang the bass part anyway. So we, I got a quartet together and we recorded it. And we sent it off to Malcolm Gladwell. This was right before COVID-19. So, you know, this is, March has been exciting for us all. And it really has been exciting for me in a lot of ways. Anyway, so I sent it out to Malcolm Gladwell and nervously waited. And then he wrote me back and he said, um, your song is genius and hilarious. And, you know, let's talk later on. And I said, okay, let's, let's talk. I said, I'll be at ACDA next week. But so, you know, call me the week after. Anyway. Now the world has changed a lot since that point, but it was really fun that Malcolm Gladwell liked my song so much. I was really excited. So that's, you know, that's the only song I have written completed so far, but it is, it is on YouTube. You can listen to it. Oh, we'll link it in the show notes so people can go and listen to it right now or at the very end too. <laughs> Absolutely. That is you're right. It has been a very big last couple months for you, but in listening to you talk and like just hearing where you're at, like this kind of thing also does just not happen to people while it might feel like it's just happening to you, Joan, like I can tell. It feels like that. It feels like it's just happening. Yes. But it's the product of the person that you've been becoming right like every, you know you mentioned you lived in germany for five years right and you've traveled and you're a hiker and you know you're a singer and you work with these people and you've become a parent and all these kinds of things i feel like yeah, all of these little experiences have been really molding you into now you are having all of these cool connections would you agree oh thank you you know i yes and i you know what beth i just want to tell every, like i turned 40 last year and I love being 40. Like no one told me that being 40 is so great. Like I had a party, I invited a hundred people. Like I am so excited to be 40. Um, in my opinion, it really beats being 20 and 30. Um, you, I just know so much more and I've learned so much more and I have so much more uh, self-compassion and, and, and um, you know, gratitude for my own journey. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm really grateful to be 40 and a little plug for everyone's always afraid to t tell how old they are, but I'm 41 now. And I love, I love my forties. So great. I believe it. So I'm, I'm 33 and I can just even say like entering my thirties was amazing. And every year it just keeps getting better because I'm leaning into that. I love that you said you've really grown into this self-compassion. And I know as women, especially we struggle that struggle with that, especially as musicians. We do. We do. And, and um, you know, that's why we need to reach out to each other. That's why we need to, ha need to have a network. That's why we need to, you know, be reflective of our own thoughts and monitor our self-dialogue and our, 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 our internal monologues, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for being on here today, for sharing just your entire journey with us. Um, I'm really excited to keep in touch with you and uh, 
yeah, continue to be uh, friends with you and hopefully see you next year at a national ACDA um, if, if we're both there. And, and thank you for writing these words. And I'm actually going to ask, um, would you not, I know I opened the episode of reading them, but would you mind closing the episode in reading them um, so we, we hear this from your voice? Oh, I'm so happy to do that. Yes. And I, once again, I just, I really am touched that what I wrote resonated with so many people. I, I really just think I said what we were all thinking. And instead of working like, and everyone else just started like planning to be a virtual online teacher. And I just, instead of doing that, like being more productive, I just wrote this, which felt productive. And I'm it, is. it is, it is, but, but I was like, everyone else has already got their lesson plans up. And I'm like, finishing this blog, but that's okay. That's okay. Anyway. Well, I, but it's a testament though to, we all have our own journeys and we're all productive in our own ways and following our own paths. And it looks different. It does. It does. And we can't compare. You're right. Yes. Thank you, Beth. All right. I'm happy to read this because choir is greater than the sum of its parts by Joan Riddle Steinman. Here's the deal, my friends, unless you are singing in a room with people, it isn't choir period. Choir is about connection. Choir is about 30 or 210 or six singers all shaping a vow so beautifully that the overtones extend up to heaven and make the angels weep. Choir is your college roommate. She won first place in your hometown Met auditions and your great aunt Ruth. She turned 89 last month and wants everyone to know she still has her high notes. They sing together every Sunday and the paint doesn't peel off the walls. Why? Choir. That's why. Choir is magical. Alone, I am a soprano, but in choir, I'm a tenor and an alto and a bass. When you sing in a choir, the sound of the whole choir comes out of your mouth. Boom. Magic. Choir isn't something you can do alone with a webcam, webcam on your computer. It just isn't. Period. So be kind to your choral friends. We are suffering. We feel this disconnect keenly. Yes, we know about Eric Whitaker and his choir his virtual choir. We love Eric. He is our token rock star and makes our whole sport sexier. And in these days of deadly airborne pathogens, choir is as much a contact sport as football. We will retreat to the sidelines. We will learn to use Zoom and Google Hangouts. We will record our voices and send them into the unknown. We retreat willingly because at the end of the day, we love great aunt Ruth and her questionable high notes. Her life is on the line and choir just isn't worth the risk. But these days won't last forever, my friends. We will make it through this. And when we sing together again, it will be amazing. Thank you, Joan, for sharing that with us and being with us today. Thanks, Beth. I just, can I say one more thing? Absolutely. Anything that we do so often can, can become um, mundane, right? Like, and I think sometimes we forget how magical choir is. Um, a few years ago, my school had an assembly and we had a, a professional storyteller come in and she had us all on the edges of our seats and we were just, um, we were amazed. We were just, you know, so fascinated by her story and her journey. And then she did a little workshop in my choir room afterwards and I asked her if we could sing to her and we did. And, you know, by the end of it, she was in tears and I thought, I'm so glad my students saw this. Like we touched her and she, she had definitely touched us. And we forget sometimes it's magic because, you know, we're all in the measures. Like, uh, that was a little flat there, you know, like that rhythm, check that in measure 16. And we, we sometimes need to sit back. And that's why it's so wonderful to collaborate and have, you know, some, have an occasional audience. And people can remind us that what we do as choir directors is magic. Like, this is pure magic. Fairy dust, Neverland, it's all, it, it, choir is magic. So... Thank you for so much for letting me be on the Choir Baton podcast, Beth. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Choir Baton listeners, I wanted to share with you about a free online course I've created for choir conductors as many choirs are forced to move contact between each other to online interactions. The Teaching Choir Amidst COVID course is designed to help you think through who your singers are and what you hope to accomplish and how you can best do that through online mediums. I don't talk about how to build a virtual choir, but I do give you tangible ideas and examples of how you can tie in-person rehearsals and performances that entire experience to an online activity and interaction. Sign up today by going to choirbaton.com 
or by clicking on the link in the show notes. We'll keep more people singing, even if it's from online.